No. <laughs> uh, how about you? Anything cooking? Did you? Yeah. Where? Yeah. All right. For how long were you out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Enough to get a tick bite and get a little bit of Rocky Mountain spotted fever or something? Oh, right, right, right. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to. Uh, Fill out the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations that I think you picked up on the way in today. Uh, the CME committee in particular is interested in any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Selden Spencer. Uh, Dr. Spencer is uh, certified in neurology, uh, polysomnography, and uh, uh, polysomnology, uh, or nocturnal somnology. Uh, he is here today to update us on consciousness and its variations, and this is part one of a two-part uh, uh, program. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. Thank you. Good enough. Appreciate it. All right. Good morning to the uh, brave souls that are here. Um, this, uh, as always, I want to thank uh, Tim Hextra and, and uh, Emily Erickson and Diarlis for helping me put this whole thing together. And uh, like previous talks, it kind of got out of control, so we had to break it apart and put it into two pieces. So uh, please come next Wednesday where I'll finish it up. And next Wednesday will be the more practical kind of stuff at looking at fainting and syncope in the context of consciousness. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start about this one because this is more about the concept of consciousness and then some of the bad things like coma, persistent vegetative state, and uh, it's kind of a downer. So hopefully next week will be a little bit more interesting and a little bit more enjoyable. So my plan is to spend about five minutes talking about definitions of consciousness. And it is really bewildering that we talk about unconscious and conscious and we don't know what we're talking about. We don't really have a good definition for consciousness. And I will give you my definition of consciousness, but I assure you that it's in dispute and controversial. And naturally, my definition of consciousness is very much based on the neural substrate, and I'll go over the neural substrate for consciousness. And we'll talk a little bit about testing and biomarkers and then get down and dirty and talk about some things of coma and variations on coma. And all the other good stuff, the fun stuff, will be next week. And there's some unknowns there. So I, get, I do encourage you to come because I think some of the videos are interesting and challenging. So, um, <clears throat> so take your pick. <clears throat> this is a series of options for what is consciousness. And they all revolve around a kind of a dualistic approach, which is what's inside, what's outside. And so from my perspective, I buy into this one, which is consciousness is the states, like belief, like pain, that are simply functions of the brain. <coughs> I like this one, which is they are just behaviors, so the brain is producing behaviors, and that's what consciousness is. And then, of course, I like the Buddhist one, which is there is a continuous stream of ever-recurring phenomenon that pinch like eddies into isolated mind very poetic at least, um, but then things get even more reductionist than me where you just talk about electricity being consciousness and things get a lot more woolly where consciousness is sort of a cultural or perhaps your soul or something of that sort. So you can ignore that if you like and just kind of suffer with me on this a little bit here. But one thing that I do agree with is that consciousness is a stream, so it's not consistent. It's like your blood pressure. It does vary, and, and it changes time to time. It's not a static phenomenon, and I do believe it comes from brain activity, mainly the cortex, but you have all the subcortical things that give you 
uh, modulations to that phenomenon, and you do need the brainstem to turn the lights on, if you will. As I said before, there are people that will argue that it's just the electrical engineering energy of the brain that defines consciousness. Certainly there are isolated parts of the brain that have more to do with consciousness, but it's the integration of all these circuits, particularly memory, that define consciousness. And basically I'll argue that the brain is kind of a prediction machine and that's, that's what consciousness is all about. So just to break it up and show a picture, this is our relative, the dolphin, <coughs> and some other mammals, uh, like dolphins, have a brain that turns off and they are independent. So in this circumstance, the dolphin is sleeping with half his brain, the flipper is down, and the other half of the brain is working just fine. So down here he's got slow waves on the contralateral side of his brain and his flipper is down and on the other side the flipper is up. Now humans don't do that, but I'd use this as an argument that consciousness, you wouldn't argue that the flipper downside is conscious, he's unconscious. Uh, and I just to use it as an argument, the brain is part of why a person is conscious or unconscious. Historically, you go back to, I showed the picture of Descartes uh, from the woodcut in the 1600s talking about pain. Descartes is still key for the whole idea of consciousness and the term cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So, I'm standing in front of you here quite confident that I'm conscious. I have no idea about you, right? I have no idea whether you guys are conscious or not. And that's the problem. It's a philosophical problem in some respects. And I judge that you're conscious if you demonstrate that you have, first of all, some self-awareness, and second of all, some element of motivation. So I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. I just do these, these last three bullet points. Uh, I had a great romance with a, a researcher out of Wisconsin, Tonini, until he published this book in 2014, which tried to reduce consciousness to a mathematical formula. At that time, the bromance was over. No more, uh, I just wasn't into him anymore. It was all over. So there's, if you wanted to dig in it, there's some critique about that whole idea. And this is the last blast of consciousness. Just to emphasize, we know what's subjective, but we don't know, I'm sorry, we know what's inside, we don't know what's outside. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at uh, Buddhist thinking or Immanuel Kant or Descartes. Sorting out what's subject and object is very problematic. So, how do I know that you are conscious? Basically, the brain is about learning and uh, predicting. So you're learning constantly. You're always taking information in. And I'll show you an example, and we'll do an example here to show how you uh, alter what your perceptions are coming in. And uh, this is demonstrated through evoked responses. Um, so it's always about predicting the future, and there's always these phrases like, the brain is basically uh, remembering the future. I love that kind of phrase. So we, we already have in our mind what everything is going on around us. So we're sitting in a chair, we fear a bottom on the chair, and we're smelling, they're feeling the temperature, and it's all consistent. We all know what's going on. And it's all this input that throws that off a little bit. And so you can imagine if your predictions are screwed up with psychosis of one sort or another, you're perceiving things that aren't there or believing things that aren't real, it's quite problematic. So here's our experiment. <coughs> Jokes. So if you get, you hear my voice, your brain is doing this a little evoked response at N100. All right? So I'm going to tell you a joke. <coughs> and your brain is going to do something out at P300, and you won't be aware of it. And that's 300 milliseconds after I tell you the joke. So, here's the joke. Why do you not want to pick a fight with a paleontologist? And paleontologist, somebody digs up bones. And you say to me, well, golly, I don't know why I don't want to pick a fight with a paleontologist. And I will tell you because you will get Jurassic kicked, all right? So Jurassic, and at 300 milliseconds, you're saying, well, this didn't fit in, but, oh, I get it. 
So whenever you hear a pun or something, it's kind of 300 milliseconds out that your brain has the world all predicted and it was disrupted momentarily. And you have to revise your thinking and your memory to accommodate that. And I'll speak about that a little bit further. But this whole talk will kind of revolve around elements of consciousness. And I, this is a lot better in color than it is in black and white uh, and your handout. But today we're going to just kind of talk a little bit down here. But uh, in one week we're going to talk a little bit about other elements, uh, seizures and parasomnias. But there are two out of my three biggies right here on the y-axis you have awareness and on the x-axis you have vigilance so from my perspective my definition of consciousness has threefold first is the lights have to be on the person has to be awake second of all the person has to be aware that is they receive stimuli and third they have to be able to act on stimuli so nothing makes me happier to be in the ICU or the emergency room and have the person react to painful stimuli. That means they're aware. And then, then spontaneously grab, try to pull the Foley out. They are motivated. They're trying to react to that stimuli. So how can you be unconscious now that we don't know what consciousness is? We're going to talk about what unconscious is. And we do have a sense about this. We do have a sense anatomically that if you take off, strip off the cortex, which happens with anoxic ischemic offense, you uh, are unconscious. <coughs> you're not awake, you're not taking in information, and you are not responding to that information. Now that it can also happen with the thalamus, it can also happen with the hypothalamus, it can happen with the brainstem, but we knew even a hundred years ago if you cut between the pons and the mesencephalon, uh, all is that's that's the end of the game. You need to have that connection with the pons to actually be awake, and that's where the awake part is. The arousal part comes from. So now we talk a little bit about biomarkers, and uh, <coughs> I am very grateful to have Dr. Moore and Dr. Bavasia very knowledgeable about EEG. And uh, it's very easy if you do an EEG and there's no activity on the cortex, well, golly, this person is uh, not functioning. However, the EEG is not reliable, and here is alpha coma. Um, just to kind of give you, uh, and I'll show you an example briefly ahead, the EEG, this is what would normally look like in your brain as you're sitting here. You have alpha rhythm, yet this is a person in coma. And I only show you this because uh, the EEG is not reliable. And a bottom line down the line is that we do EEGs. Sometimes they help us. Sometimes they don't. Um, it turns out alpha waves in coma are different than alpha waves with you sitting in this room. But I'm not going to get into that. That's one biomarker. <coughs> and here's another biomarker. Now, Audra. This is a medical student, and we're going to break up the talk by bringing forward a sculpture that stands in uh, Dr. Kitchell's office day in and day out. And this is kind of a little rendition of Vanna White. Here you can kind of hold it up and show it to you. That's right. We're not going to bid on this. But, uh, you know, there was a real excitement about phrenology at one point, and there are people that were masters at feeling the skull and telling you whether you were a selfish person or whether you had good verbal skills. The point of that is that phrenology was kind of baloney, but it was also an effort to localize things. So we're good on that, but this now this trend is to use things like functional MRI, which measures blood flow and oxygen concentrations in the brain, as a modern-day phrenology, if you will, to say what's working, what causes what. Having said that, this is a recent study comparing normal controls and 36 DOCs, disorders of consciousness, so persistent vegetative state, comas of that sort or another. And this is the kind of bare minimum. <coughs> if you are normal, you've got good function by thalamically, or in the thalamus here, if you're abnormal with one of these disorders, you do not have this. 
okay. But bear that in mind, it's kind of a phrenology, and, and much like the fallacy of the alpha coma, you take it with a grain of salt. And biomarkers in general, we'd love to have them, but you're still relying on your clinical assessment. And my bio, bottom line, which is, are they awake? Are they aware? Are they able to act on things? So this gentleman, Schiff, um, has done a major contribution in connecting coma with anesthesia and particularly highlighting an element of coma. When you induce uh, anesthesia, you can get paradoxical excitement. And it's provided a very nice insight that I'll talk about a little bit later on. But uh, to beat it to death again, I think the person has to be uh, awake, that is the lights are on, and they are perceiving stimuli and they are acting on stimuli. Those are the, that's my definition of consciousness. Now arousal, so a couple slides about arousal itself, and we know a ton about this, particularly from the sleep literature, that there are chemicals that are crucial. We know where they're located, we know their pathways, and um, I don't want to beat that to death. I'll show you a picture here. Simplistically, s the stuff in the dorsal brainstem, particularly the pontine area, projects up to the cortex and turns the lights on. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to act on that or you're going to perceive things properly, but you've got to turn the lights on, and there's an additional pathway through the basal forebrain and the hypothalamus. Um, so we've known about this arousal system forever. Uh, these other chemicals all have interesting roles to play and lots of details, but I'm going to let that go. Just to show you another picture that you can have the serotonin nuclei and the locus ceruleus and all the acetylcholine around that projecting forward to turn the surface of the brain on, the cortex. <coughs> Now, back to the EEG, and this is very valid because, again, I showed you the picture of alpha coma. One thing that's unique about alpha coma is there's no reactivity. So when we do EEGs, you try to stimulate the brain in one way or another, and one of the simplest things you can have the patient do is open their eyes. If they open their eyes, all of a sudden there's more input and there's more disorganization on the surface of the brain. If the eyes are closed, there's no visual input, and you get very nice, calm rhythms in the back like that. And that speaks a little bit to these reverberating circuits between the thalamus and cortex. And brain waves can drive you crazy. I just put this in here to criticize it. I mean, these are the types of things that if you have alpha rhythm, you have consciousness. I just showed you an example where that's not the case. Uh, you can quibble, this is one kind of alpha rhythm versus another, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I just put this on here to criticize it a little bit. Um, now, these are shorter, so we've talked about turning the lights on. Now, how do you know that something is coming in? And again, it's all predictive coding. You already have a percept in your brain of what everything feels like, tastes like, smells like, and you're just taking that information and it's correlated and it's all good. It works fine. It's all probability, and a lot with the association cortex. So here we have the brain uh, being turned on, and then visual input coming in and disorganizing everything, and you have to kind of process, well, is this really working or not? I love this slide, so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it. So you're out there sitting, maybe out in the, uh, in the taking a walk, and your brain is happy, cooking along, you know what a walk is like, and you see over there, well, there's two objects, and your brain is starting to process this visual input, and it tries to match up your memory of, well, you got something in there that matches that. Oh, yeah, yeah, German Shepherd, yeah, there we go. Okay, there's the German Shepherd. So at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're kind of sitting inside your brain, looking at a movie that you already know, and you're just hoping that stuff coming through your ears and through your eyes correlates to that movie that you already have going on. You're just kind of predictive. <coughs> Motivation, that is acting on that sensory input. There's only one thing that I, only one slide and only one point to make, which is we know dopamine is key to that. So. If I feel that somebody does not have the motivation to move or to do or react in any kind of a logical fashion, 
one of the things I'm worried about is dopamine. I'm worried about these pathways toward the uh, bottom of the brain, the basal forebrain. So back to now down and dirty, talking about anesthesia and coma. Clinically, there are four varieties, well, five varieties we're going to talk about. Brain death is really pretty easy. And so just kind of run this through, which is there's no brain stem function and there's no consciousness. Remember, consciousness would be you're aroused, you're aware of things coming in, and you act on that stuff. Coma, on the other hand, you have brainstem function, but there is no consciousness. All right? And that's where things start getting slippery because we argue about what is conscious, what is not conscious, and it gets even worse when you talk about persistent vegetative state where there is brainstem function and there may be arousal. The lights may come on, but there is no awareness and there is no action or motivation going on. Minimally consciousness is just a furthering down the line, and maybe there is arousal and awareness, but no motivation, not ability to act on that information. I just need to throw a word about locked in because that's something where we get called into tasks to try and help with, and it's where a person has no ability to act. They have their quadriplegic, but they are fully aware, they're fully conscious, and they can either through eye blinking or something like that tell you what they want to do or not do. All right, there's all these other terms. Oops, I, sorry, I skipped ahead there. I, ooh, where we go? Previous, there we are. All right, all these other terms, and I love, for ICDM coding, I love the term encephalopathy. It's a great term, it's a garbage can term, but they'll pay for it. So again, that's the term you want to use for everything is the grab all, catch all, it's great. But all these other things, man, they're terrible. These are just terrible terms. Um, and I tried to do my best to talk about them, but when I did this, I hearkened back to my neurosurgical rotations, which would kill you if you used any of these terms. You were to go to the bedside and say, Patient lies quietly, eyes closed, on ventilator, not responsive to voice or pain. And, you know, just describe what you got. You do not use these garbage words that nobody really knows what you're talking about. Um, I'm sorry, a little critical there, but, uh, you know, you, you got to be careful. All right, so now we talk about brain death. And it's pretty easy, as I said before. You get rid of all the confounders, particularly medications. Make sure the temperature and blood pressure is okay. And then you just check for all the reflexes, motor and brainstem. You see how they respond to various noxious stimuli. The EEG and other ancillary tests do not help, but we always do them. And they're instructive. And I would like to draw you to a guy by the name of Widjex up at Mayo Clinic who every two or three years goes on a tear because there's somebody presenting an article about, well, the cerebral blood flow was okay, and this person was in coma, there's got to be something wrong. Do not do that. Ancillary tests don't help. Your clinical assessment is how we define death, brain death at this point. And uh, just a little plug for the people that come in and do organ donation, they do a beautiful job. They're very careful and um, legally you need to have a good neurologic exam to uh, define somebody as having brain death. If they are brain dead, you still got the whole question of uh, how far are you going to support them, whether there's organ donation and on and on and on. And are they going to get better? I will talk about that momentarily, but um, generally not. <coughs> so here is my one and only sample of brain death, and I did then use an EEG. And I didn't do an exam. We'll do an exam later on. But just to hear the rhythm of the ventilator, no action on the brain. EEG techs do a great job of trying to bring all this out. Um, so I've said my two cents on that, I think. Onwards. OK, so now we move. We're done with brain death. We talk about coma persistent vegetative state, and minimal consciousness. And I've already kind of said my harangue, and this is a little bit of a, a transition. So coma, there's some brainstem function, but they're not conscious. 
DBS, some function, some evidence of arousal, but no awareness. MCS, maybe motivation. And there's some interesting things about this that we'll talk about. So very glossy, we could talk about this all day. But let's say somebody comes in, and of course the classic joke is uh, Dr. Spencer, the guy was acting weird, we gave him some uh, Valium, we intubate him, we put him on rocumonium, and his CT is normal, what's wrong with him? Okay, you know, the same old joke. Well, he's paralyzed and ventilated, that's the number one thing. But, you know, you have to do the drill, and it is good if they're paralyzed and ventilated, um, that their blood pressure is okay, and you can do a CT of the head, and if it's abnormal, you have this whole spectrum of things to work through. Uh, it's white matter damage, maybe there's some dramatic uh, um, immune process which would respond to corticosteroids and then various surgical things you can do. If it's normal, you kind of focus on normal things, uh, toxic exposures, infection, on and on. Now, I think I just got to make sure I got that right. Okay, good. All right. So, again, pathologically, we know what looks like coma. In other words, they do autopsies. And there's three v flavors, not any big surprise. If you wiped out all the cells, you have a laminar necrosis on the cortex. The cortex doesn't work. The cell's dead. Then you're in coma. If you have a bad head injury and the wires going from the brain stem to the cortex are all sheared and damaged, you're in coma. And likewise, if you get pressure or stroke, that will damage selective areas that will lead to coma. Um, toxic insults will temporarily, hopefully, uh, be creating the same uh, problem. And I just kind of like this slide about toxidromes, and I think just as a, just a reminder, if you see somebody who is very symmetric and you don't have anything obvious on a CT and they got tremendous autonomic disturbances, you want to think about some kind of a toxic exposure. The ones with cholinergic, anticholinergic, and the stuff we see a lot with extrapyramidal syndromes and too much dopamine, too much little dopamine um, are common or more common. Okay, so brain injuries, just to kind of run through that. Again, if you wipe out the cerebrum, you're in coma. If you take out a good portion of the thalamus, you're in coma. If you take out a good portion of the hypothalamus, you can be in coma. Whereas, if you get into the brain stem and it's just the bottom, you're locked in. You take out the top, you will be in coma. And just an example of different kind of mechanisms of herniation that you've all seen along the way. Now, when we assess for coma, I think this is kind of interesting, maybe a take-home point. Um, respiratory pattern, motor, pupils, and eye movements. I always kind of like the idea of going to these resuscitations down in the emergency room, and they're crushing away at the chest and trying to get something going, and I just kind of sneak up and look over the head and look down at the pupils, and it um, gives you a good idea of what the future looks like um, without going any further. The term we use most is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and this does not have anything to do with respiration. So we use this, uh, but uh, it's considered at least by Dr. Wiejcik and others as an inadequate coma scale. But still, for practical purposes, this is what you got in the emergency room and in the ICU. And you get a nice number that applies to, that we can translate. You know, if somebody's got a Glasgow coma scale of four, uh, that's not good. If they have a coma scale of 12, well, maybe that's not so bad. Um, so what is the best motor response? I think you're familiar with, you can do some localization, press on the supraorbital ridge or at the jaws and they reach up, that's really good motor response. Whereas if you see the decorticate, you already can localize to the midbrain, the decerebrate down to the pons. Cranial nerves, we could beat this to death forever, but the pupils are very nice, very nice little arc telling you the integrity of this part of the brain. Corneal's very nice, very easy to get, and gives you an integrity of the pons at that point. And then you get the reflex movements of the eyes, talking about the extraocular movements. And again, you need to establish cranial nerve function to talk about uh, brain death or coma. This is the four score scale that used up at Mayo that includes a respiratory component. So instead of three categories, you have 
eye movements, you have motor response, you have pupillary response, and respiratory response. Just another way of scoring things. Now, this is your outcome of coma. And it's, I love to tell this story because this came out when I was in residency. And this is what I dragged around in my pocket for about two decades. I lost it subsequently. But uh, this was an uh, article published by Levy and Corona that looked at the outcome of hypoxic ischemic damage to people, post-cardiac arrest. And this looks terrible. You look at this, oh, all these numbers, all these numbers. If I would ever sit down with a family to go over these numbers, I would just focus on three things. Here we go. Number one, in the ER, or immediately in the ICU, do the corneals and do the pupils react? This is immediately after you've gotten a heart rate back or something like that. The outcome's terrible. 97% don't get better. 90%, okay? Uh, you can wait 24 hours and come back the next morning, and it's the same number. I mean, it's 98% don't get better. Or you can wait three days, and 96% don't get better. Just looking at a few things, I should add on the third day, you want to throw in the motor component. But this was a very telling, and it has nothing to do with somebody in coma from infection. It has nothing to do with somebody in coma from a toxic exposure. This is hypoxic ischemic, but still it translates a little bit. And uh, you don't do this to rain on anybody's parade, but just to kind of have people sober. And I always try to buy three days. I said, you know, let's just see. You know, we've got a lot of things going on here. Things don't look real good right now, but uh, give it some time and see if we can't uh, get a little more oxygen to the brain and check a few things. And but anyway, that's the gloomy outcome of this kind of circumstance of coma. Now, <coughs> what if they don't, what are some of the bad outcomes from coma? And the bad outcomes are vegetative state, mild cognitive, uh, or minimal consciousness state. And so to cover this again, it's pretty simple. You knock out this brainstem part in coma, you're not awake. The lights are never on. Whereas in persistent vegetative state, the lights do work. You can turn it on, but you just don't process things. So you're not aware, you're not able to act on things. So PBS, they appear awake, but they're not conscious. And I'll have a video here in a moment. Um, interestingly, the diagnostic accuracy on a clinical basis is not very good. And there's a lot of publication out of Britain that talks about that's why they keep coming back to these biomarkers to try and give you a better idea of what's PBS, minimal conscious state. And you know there was tons of press about taking people with uh, uh, persistent vegetative state, putting them in a functional MRI and asking them, they look awake and they say, well now you think about playing tennis. And lo and behold, now I actually don't know what part of the cortex is associated with tennis, but anyway, they would say that that part of the cortex would light up. So is that person aware uh, and able to process that information? I would tell you that the study that was done had three out of 16 people that they showed could do something like this. And it's a little spooky and it's a little troublesome on an ethical basis as to what you're doing, but um, certainly they're not able to willfully act on that information. And it only gets worse with minimally conscious state. Uh, there is a sense of transition from coma, PBS to MCS to running, playing tennis, but um, it usually stalls out uh, and doesn't go anywhere year after year. Um, so in a minimally conscious state, they have the lights on, they seem to be aware, and they seem to try to communicate. And you'll see that there's a global use of, uh, of cellular activity and glucose that's quite different between PBS and MCS. And also in terms of anatomically where it is in the cortex. Okay, so Tim, hold my hand here. Let's see if we can get this to go. I simply took this from um, a training video, and uh, this is it. And so just bear with me for a couple of minutes on this, and we'll go through it. <coughs> in this video, a patient in a persistent vegetative state is shown. 
This patient had a severe traumatic brain injury five years previously that led to this state. Some elements of the neurological examination are demonstrated here. Responses follow reflexive pathways in the brainstem and are not associated with sensations or other integral faculties. First, we see a lack of responsiveness and no awareness of surroundings by the patient. The eyes are closed. We see there is no response to a voice command and no eye opening. We see that after a pain stimulus is applied, the patient develops a spontaneous clonus and opens the eyes. We see that the patient is not responding to a salvo of loud hand claps. In addition, a nail bed compression stimulus produces a generalized clonus, but again there is no sense of awareness and no grimacing. In this close-up view of the eye, nystagmoid <coughs> eye movements are seen. Note that the right eye is red due to a filamentary keratitis, which is a well-known complication with patients who are in a permanent vegetative state. We now demonstrate the abnormal phenomenon known as doll's eyes. With head turning, the eyes move back and forth. Furthermore, there is no blinking to threat in both eyes and no tracking of the reflex hammer. The eyes move erratically, but never fixate. Tapping on the lips produces a positive snout reflex. Here we demonstrate marked spasticity and contractures in the lower extremities. A clonus is easily elicited with a reflex hammer. Reflexes are brisk in the lower limbs, but difficult to elicit in the ankles due to ankle contractures. However, a clonus can still be found. Okay, that's as much as I want to do on that. Uh, reduce that. And it goes on and on and on. But I just wanted to have a, an example to show you. And I think I just close that down. I hope. All right. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> All right. So, difference between PVS and MCS, there's a little difference in terms of prognosis. MCS may actually get better. Uh, there's difference in cortical glucose use and cellular activity. The PVS, they do have activity in the sensory cortex, whereas MCS goes to association cortex. And now this really bizarre thing that's come up over the last couple years which is why you're still here. This is a great story about Zolpidem, Ambien, correcting coma. Isn't that cool? So here, here's the story. So, oh, I guess not yet. All right. So this is stuff about MCS. Oh, I only wanted to talk about, again, using biomarkers. And this is kind of a cute thing. There is an AL activation likelihood estimate. And now somebody's come out with a new protocol called ginger ale. That's the only reason I wanted to put that in. I thought that was pretty cute. Okay, so here's the story. And I think let's start down here at the bottom, which is very interesting. Here's somebody awake. And you can see all that sugar and glucose and cellular activity and blood flow and oxygen utilization is going crazy. In anesthesia, there's this phenomenon of paradoxical excitation where the brain is not shut down, but... Um, they're kind of transition. They're not here, and they're not over here, and you don't ever want to be here. This is where there isn't anything going on at all. In PVS, you're kind of in between, all right? You're here. Now, the importance of this paradoxical excitation is that you can take somebody with MCS, and you can give them zolpidem, and you can have them say a word or take a step showing some ex evidence of motivation or ability to act on it. And it's all analogous to the whole Parkinson's metaphor. So in Parkinson's, you know, you have the left cortex telling the right hand to do this, and you don't need the striatum or the caudate to tell it to do that. But the caudate and striatum can certainly screw up in Parkinson's to the point that you can't use your hand very well. Same thing with consciousness. You can have the cortex ready to have the person speak and act and do anything, and the striatum is screwing it up. And by shutting down the globus, or globus pallidus interna with loads of zolpidem, it only lasts for a half hour, 20 milligrams, you can convert this system. It's very fascinating. And if you like kind of uh, more structural approaches to it, you have the globus pallidus interna trying to shut down 
the behavior of the striatum and the thalamus, and if you shut it down, in turn, you release the behavior of the cortex. So in these coma situations, pushing dopamine to crank up the striatum and using zolpidem in combination are the rage in trying to help people with the minimally conscious state. So I've talked about biomarkers, and I think uh, I don't want to talk about it more. I think that's kind of where I'm at at this. Um, I have one more slide on that, but we are going to talk about this next week in terms of seizures. So here everybody's happy, the brain's awake, everything's good. Then you get part of the brain going crazy and the EEG is going crazy and all of a sudden it takes over the whole world and shuts down the brain and so the EEG goes down. So EEG is very interesting, very useful, but can be frustrating as well. And I've already showed you this, the difference between consciousness and unconsciousness. But I didn't show you this, which is a beautiful signature thing of here's somebody conscious with lots of oxygen utilization going on. Vegetative state, not much. Locked in, pretty good. MCS, definitely better than vegetative state. Okay, so you get this sequence there. And I, I wrestled with including this. I wanted to say something about a biomarker called GABA-A receptors and this will come to fore at some point or another as a just a crude marker of cellular activity. And here's a table about coma. And uh, just to have something, if you've forgotten everything I've said or whatever. All right, so a couple of oddities, and I wanted to spend a moment on this, <coughs> particularly blind sight. And you're familiar with blind sight. Blind sight is you've lost the cortex, visual cortex, on one side. And you work in that one side. They can't see anything. But if you show them symbols or you show them colors, they're able, and you force them to guess, they will come up with the right answer. This bespeaks the whole concept of consciousness. I mean, it kind of erodes my <laughs> notion of where consciousness resides or how people perceive that. I, I just throw out these things because I think there's a lot of anomalies that we really don't understand. I'm very hard-boiled about the whole idea of, you know, consciousness is, the lights are on, you are aware of stuff, and you act on that stuff. But if you can throw in the whole thing of clairvoyance, I could have Steve sitting in a room, and he's got a telephone in, in front of him, and there are four people that are going to call him. And he is forced to guess who is calling him when that phone rings. There are some people that can make more than random guess on that. So there's a lot of wooly stuff out there that we don't understand fully about consciousness. And of course, politically, I had to ask whether corporations are conscious. They are human. No, anyway, leave that alone. OK, so this is my conclusion. My reductionist definition includes arousal, awareness, and motivation. Brain death is defined clinically. There are multiple causes for coma, and we didn't beat that to death. And this bizarre thing of PBS and MCS improving with the use of dopamine and <laughs> GABA agents. And that uh, first half is done. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so give it a whirl. Anybody want to um, chime in? How about Dirk? I bet I thought the psychiatrist would have some idea about consciousness there. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. When, when, does, uh, when do they think consciousness occurs in a fetus? Well, if you accept my definition, you know, it would probably be two or three years old in terms of, you know, when they get their sleep-wake cycles getting a little bit better. Um, because... I mean, that's my speculation, Paul. I, I mean, I, what do you think? Do you have any notion? No idea. <laughs> well, I mean, think about everybody in this room. When is, what is your first memory? When is your first memory? Yeah. I mean, mine was around four or five years old. I think you have to have memory in place in order to do the whole predictive game. Your memory says, oh, yeah, this is the world around me, and I'm taking information in, and it has to respond to that. Um, that's a, sorry to say, very good question, but I don't have an idea. I think there's probably some way to get at that. Maybe when they can do an ERP, when they can do that 300 millisecond response, you know, to an oddball stimulus.
reflexes that go away, the primitive reflexes that go away, when those resolve mm -hmm. would be when consciousness becomes and awareness comes because you learn. And so it would be somewhere between six months and a year. Okay. I think that's a good argument. I think that's all right. But we have Arborasia, you know, there's a lot of network going on on as we well know it probably goes on into the twenties trying to build that work. Okay. Well I think that's enough. I uh, hope to see you next week and there'll be some interesting videos. So thank you. <coughs>